Hi, everyone. I am Kenny Coogan. I'm the Education Director for the International Carnivorous Plant Society. And we are very excited to have Drew Martinez here to talk about grow lights for carnivorous plants. Before he begins, I just want to do a quick intro about our wonderful organization. Since January, we've been doing virtual happy hours once a month, in addition to the webinars. Our next happy hour is going to be Thursday, April 21st at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Last month, we were, our happy hour was about two hours and like 15 minutes. So we really encourage you to come. You can talk about what you're growing. You can share your problems. It's a great resource if you're a member of ICPS. Another great resource is on Wednesday, May 4th, we will be having our second annual World Carnivorous Plant Day. It's the first Wednesday in May. And last year, what I did was we invited people from around the world to submit videos and we released them. We released one video every hour on the hour on May 4th. So around midnight, my time, we start releasing the Japanese and Australian videos, which is eight o'clock, nine o'clock in the morning for them. And then we just work around the world. And all of these videos are archived on our Facebook page or our YouTube page, so you can check them out. And this year we have another great lineup of guests, which I'm very excited about. Part of World Carnivorous Plant Day is our annual photo contest. In order to submit five entries, you need to be a member of ICPS, or you just need to follow our Facebook page or our Instagram page. And if you are one of the three winners, you win a one-year subscription to ICPS. The deadline is coming up April 22nd. And then the last hour for World Carnivorous Plant Day, we play the big photo slideshow. And then at the very, very end, we will show you who the winners are. And the judges for this year are the winners from last year. So we have representation from France, Poland, and Australia. Uh, if you want to support ICPS, if you go to our website, carnivorousplants.org, and then you click on World Carnivorous Plant Day, you see that we have some merch. You can get a shirt, mug, tote, t-shirt, tank top lots of things, and the proceeds from that goes to our conservation fund. Another uh, exciting thing that we did starting last year was we did Carnivores in the Classroom grant. In August, we opened up applications for teachers K through 12, and we were able to fund 24 classrooms with $150 each to add carnivorous plants to their classroom. And these grants were from all over the world. If you think that's important and you would like to uh, donate, you can go to carnivorousplants.org slash donate. And those funds can be directed directly to the Carnivores in the Classroom grant. If you have a teacher friend, tell them to check out our website around August 1st to submit an application. So Drew is going to do a great presentation about grow lights for carnivorous plants. If you have a question, please type them down here in the chat box and then I will sort through them and I will ask the questions uh, at the end of his presentation. Yeah, I'm gonna talk about grow lights for carnivorous plants today. And, um, you know, I, I grow plants across a number of genera. And, um, you know, the, the thing that strikes me uh, about um, grow lights, particularly for carnivorous plants is they're so important because these these plants are light lovers in general, right? So it's particularly um, pertinent that we understand um, some of the technical issues behind lighting because, you know, without, um, without good lighting, we're not going to be able to grow our plants very well, right? For example, like there's other groups, you know, that I, you know, I also grow some aeroids and orchids and other things. And there's some people that actually just get by with ambient light and they can be just fine, you know, but good luck doing that with, uh, you know, uh, growing a nice sundew and, you know, <laughs> In, um, you know, in the, in the corner of a room or a nice, um, you know, upright growing Saracenia. Um, so I'm going to get into the technical part at the start of this, uh, this presentation. And then by the end, we're going to talk about some practical growing considerations. Um, 
you know, um, that, you know, uh, might apply to a number of different um, uh, configurations or plant setups. Um, so we'll jump right in. So um, I don't want this to be a bad physics lesson. So <laughs> just just uh, introducing the, the, the concept here that um, um, light is a particle um, in a sense, and you know, we, we can actually count um, the number of photons coming out, and that's that's a measure that we will use later on whenever we're characterizing grow lights. So usually, what happens, um, you know, th there's a lot of ways you can generate photons coming out. Um, you know, uh, mo most often with our um, our grow lights, um, we're figuring out a way to excite an electron to a higher energy state, and then as it falls from that um, that that higher energy state, um, it, it emits a photon. Right, and you know, with grow lights, we're usually just trying to um, um, uh, create that excited energy state uh, just with electricity through the wall. Um, and um, you know, it's it's also you know, I should also mention that um, photons have um, uh, energy, and uh, that energy is related to the wavelength of light. You know, in particular, um, their color. Um, so lights are all uh, light is also electromagnetic. Um, it's a wave in nature. So we, um, you know, here's the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum. And, you know, I'm showing this just to show that, um, you know, light, um, you know, changes color as it um, changes its wavelength, I guess, you know, that's what we're able to perceive by the eye. Um, you know, and it also change the amount of energy it's uh, each photon is carrying or each wave is carrying. Um, so, Here's just a, a, an overview of um, photosynthesis. Um, you know, so we've got two separate um, reactions that are always going on um, whenever we're um, we're analyzing the system. We have one um, called the light reaction, where essentially light comes in. It's going to hit um, some pigments that are sensitive to light. You know, they're, you know, they're arranged in sort of like an antenna complex. Um, you know, through a series of reactions, um, water um, is converted to um, oxygen. And then um, you also get some molecules that, um, that are energized um, through these reactions, um, oxidation reduction reactions. Um, so those energized molecules um, will get transferred over to the dark reaction or the Calvin cycle. And um, the Calvin cycle there, um, you know, it, it, it turns out those are energetic molecules. It takes in CO2 um, and it spits out sugar at the, at the end of the cycle. And that's, that's what plants need to do all the happy things plant do, plants do. You know, they, they form cell walls, um, you know, and they, um, you know, they, they respirate just like um, animal cells would, you know, so they're taking in energy there and, um, or taking in sugar there and then turning it into um, you know, all their processes they need to keep on growing and, and living. Um, so I mentioned that, that, you know, photons come in and they hit this antenna complex. You know, this, we're essentially just trying to catch photons here, right? So um, um, the interesting thing to me is this, this antenna complex is actually very intricate, like within in its design. It's, it's just kind of like a big net. And, you know, photons will come in and they'll hit, you know, a certain light sensitive pigment in that antenna complex, and they'll kind of funnel their way down into the center of that antenna. And, uh, and that's where they'll be transferred, the energy will be transferred into an intermediary state, um, you know, and then uh, eventually become a more stable chemical state later on. Um, but the interesting thing to me here is that we've got a whole bunch of different pigments just kind of um, arranged around each other, and um, they're able to um, to capture uh, different wavelengths of light, you know, based on what the, the chemical structure is of that pigment. And so um, here's an absorbance, absorption spectrum. So essentially we're, we're taking a look at what the wavelength of light uh, coming in and what the, you know, the efficiency of absorption is, um, you know, on the, on the y-axis. Um, you know, and, and so I'm paying particular attention right now to the, uh, the graphic on the left, right? And you see there's all these different pigments right there. There's chlorophyll, you know, beta carotene, uh, lycopene, all, you know, all these different pigments there. And um, um, they, they absorb light, you know, more efficiently at different wavelengths. One of the interesting things that I found is um, people ha often had a, uh, a false assumption that light coming in to those green wavelengths were um, um, 
these pigments are less, um, are, you know, uh, efficiently absorbing. Um, you know, a lot of people or, you know, or, or the, the general consensus was that um, these photons uh, are useless when in fact, um, they are actually quite useful. It's just, they are absorbed, um, you know, instead of maybe at the surface level, um, they, you know, they'll, they'll propagate through the leaf and they'll be absorbed like into deeper tissue, um, you know, or maybe be reflected by the backside of the leaf. There's a lot of plants, you know, especially understory plants that have some type of mechanism that, um, you know, promotes a double pass through the leaf. Um, in any case, um, you, know, you can see on the right, this is uh, the photosynthetic action spectrum, which actually, you know, as a whole, you know, with, you know, when you're, you're taking into account all the antenna complexes, like um, this right here characterizes, um, you know, uh, how efficiently photons are being absorbed based on their wavelength right here. And you can see it's pretty broad. And, you know, unsurprisingly, this has evolved to, um, to be very similar to what our, you know, um, uh, daylight spectrum is, you know, coming from the sun. Um, another interesting thing to note, um, at least for, um, for our purposes when we're char characterizing lights for growing plants, is that um, um, our eyes are efficient in um, our, our luminous efficiency or, you know, like um, the, the, our eyes response to light is quite different than what a plant's response to light will be. So a lot of metrics out there, um, characterize um, you know, light with regards to what our eyes are perceiving when really we should be looking at the photosynthetic action spectrum um, uh, or photosynthetically active radiation um, like that graphic I showed you in the previous slide, right? So here's just a chart, like the middle, this middle bell curve is you know, what our eye is seeing and absorbing and then this more broader, uh, broad kind of box, um, um, boundaries right there. Um, that that's characterizing more the the, the range with which plants resor, um, absorb um, photons, right? And um, there are equivalents, you know, like uh, you know, they're uh, between vision and um, you know, like um, what plants are absorbing or in horticulture. And you know, say like a uh, luminous efficiency, you know, that would the equivalent would be photosynthetically active radiation. Um, you know, whenever that people characterize things in terms of lumens or watts, that's actually weighted by the eyes response function. So um, whenever we're thinking about grow lights, a better way to weight, um, you know, um, the, you know, photo photon absorption would be to take a look at the photosynthetic uh, photon flux or PPF. And then, you know, just, just kind of like counting the bucket, um, you know, but there's a lot of photons coming in, you know, in, in most appreciable, you um, um, you know, applications. So we count these in units of micromoles per second, um, you know, using Avogadro's number. And that's, um, you know, that's a big one right here, right? Um, so here's, uh, there's different ways you can measure um, uh, PPF. Um, one of the, the most common ones is um, uh, you use a big integrating sphere, um, you know, like the one shown in this, uh, this graphic. Essentially, we're just counting photons. Um, um, you know, for a given light source that gets put into that device. Um, so um, another important metric is the photosynthetic photon efficiency. So here we, we're taking that um, uh, PPF, how many photons are coming in, and we're dividing by the amount of electrical power um, that we're putting in. Um, and so PPE is really just a matter of efficiency, right? Like photons out for electrical power in. Um, let's see, um, something we should, um, you know, just always take into account as well is um, light uh, generally spreads um, as it goes over, uh, you know, it, it goes a, a certain distance away, um, you know, like light coming from a single point, um, you know, will kind of spread out in a sphere. Um, so, you know, if we have, uh, you know, grow light, um, you know, you, you, you just need to understand that, you know, as the, the amount of photons the um, that are coming out of the light is constant, you know, as you um, have a greater and greater surface area away from the light, um, you know, you're going to get um, less photons per unit area. So we come to this metric called PPFD, which is, you know, essentially what, what I just characterize is, you know, as, as photons spread out, um, you know, you get, you, you, you start, um, well, you, you characterize how many photons are um, impinging on a certain area. 
right. So um, right here, um, we've got a grow light. Just this is like a bar grow light, um, you know, kind of like a like a four foot form factor. And I'm just showing two different charts, right? Um, one, we're six inches away from the grow light, and we see like um, you know you get very high um, PPFD um, directly underneath the grow light, but you know as you come out to the edges, um, it's uh, it drops off quite a bit, right? Like your your PPFD. Um, whereas like, uh, right on, on the right side, you're like 24 inches away from the grow light and you can see this is much more uniform, um, but not as you don't get such high PPFD right in the center, you know, because those photons are also spread to, um, the outside. Um, you measure PPFD a number of ways. Um, the handiest is they make these, uh, these, uh, photon meters, um, now they're they're actually have come down quite a bit in price, um, but you know they usually have some type of little mechanism on there to make sure that um, it's accounting for light from all angles um, equally. Uh, it's called a cosine corrector. Um, there's an, other tools that are much more economical that um, um, that are generally used um, for measuring um, uh, lighting situations for cameras. And these measure lux instead of PPFD, so you need to be wary that you know if you're using them for plants that you're um, correctly um, making a conversion. And I will show a conversion table later of how to move over from lux to PPFD, and you know that you can use in certain circumstances. There's also these old school um, photometers that um, um, uh, just uh, you would just put into your greenhouse and um, and it would tell you a light level. I've never found those to be particularly reliable. Um, you know, just because they, they're not cosine corrected, so they really depend a lot on angle, um, but they can tell you something. Um, actually, um, before I move on to that, um, shoot, let me see if I can back up. Um, there is one other thing that I've used um, that is rather convenient and, you know, um, equally as reliable, at least at these economical, uh, or uh, compared to these economical light meters, is uh, there's some phone apps out um, that, you know, they use the, the camera on your phone to measure how much light. And in a pinch, um, they can be useful, at least making relative comparisons. For absolute measurements, I wouldn't trust them. Um, but, you know, you've got one area, um, you know, say next to um, uh, like maybe some heliamphora or something that are growing in a, in a tank, and you want to kind of match that light level um, in another location um, using the same, uh, the same lighting or at least um, um, spectrum the lighting, then, you know, you can get a, a rough uh, measurement, uh, you know, just using these, uh, these apps on the phones. So um, I'm going to characterize some light sources now. Um, so first, like I talked about daylight before, right? So um, this is just zooming in on in the region between 400 nanometers and, um, you know, about 750 nanometers or so. Um, and this is just like the, uh, this would be called the D65, um, spectrum. Um, light um, around the world is actually quite different, and that depends on a, um, a number of variables. You know, it could be a geographic location, but what time of day, what season it is, you know, your local landscape, your local weather conditions, all these play a role in um, how, how light propagates through the atmosphere in, you know, to your, your spot. Um, Right, but D65 is regarded as the standard, um, um, or like a standard of of, um, of daylight, um, at least in uh, the northern hemisphere. Um, let's see, and then uh, I should also mention, just you know, to keep this in mind, uh, PPFD of direct sunlight is somewhere around 2,000 um, 2, micromoles per second per meter squared. So. Um, T8 fluorescence. This is kind of a tried and true technology. Um, the, I use these quite a bit, um, you know, especially um, in the, my early days of growing about 20 years ago. Um, they um, they finally, you know, prior to T8s, <laughs> you, um, you know, you weren't really able to use a, a, a light source that wasn't like a, um, a commercial grow fixture to, to grow many carnivores just because you weren't putting out a ton of light. Um, so anyways, um, these guys, um, um, you know, they're, they're an older technology. Um, they've got a PPE of 0.84. Just keep that in mind for later on as we characterize other lights. Um, one thing to note is the bulb um, um, light output or PPF um, 
it drops as uh, time goes on. So you're going to have to replace these quite often, or else um, you know you're going to you lose um, quite a bit of efficiency. Uh, T5 fluorescent um, was specifically de uh, developed for horticulture. Uh, for well, I'm not sure if overall the technology was for horticulture, but it certainly was quickly adopted just based on the lighting needs. Um, and these are a bit higher in efficiency, uh, 1.23 micromoles per joule. Um, and um, they, um, they suffer from the same ailment as um, T8s in that they, the bulb um, will age and um, they need to be replaced at least yearly or else you're gonna lose some efficiency. Um, I'm gonna do this quick, ceramic metal halides. These are great if you're growing in a, you know, like a, an environment you need high intensity light or greenhouse growing. Um, um, they, they're fairly efficient, um, you know, can go all the way up to 1.5 micromoles per joule. Um, uh, problem is they generally come in fixtures that are really intense. This is not something you'd want in your living room. Um, you know, you, you definitely want this in more of like a, possibly a very large grow tent um, or, um, um, you know, or like greenhouse growing as a supplement or, you know, a grow room. Um, high pressure sodium, same deal as uh, ceramic metal halide. You know, they can get fairly efficient, 1.72 micromoles per joule. Um, you know, this is ceramic metal halides and, and high pressure sodium lights were uh, or are um, kind of uh, a little bit older school technology for a lot of the people that grow cannabis, um, you know, just because cannabis needs higher, um, higher lighting requirements. There's some um, um, thoughts about the spectrum that, you know, one is for, um, for growth, one is for flowering. Um, I think they're moving away from that, uh, you know, that, that line of thinking, um, at least with L LED technology, where everything is headed, they're just simply more efficient. Um, what's going on? Uh, let's see. Um, sorry, Kenny, is there an uh, issue? Sorry, I saw a notification pop up on my, um, let's see. Uh, Kenny, can you um, uh, can you talk to me? Um, okay, let's see. Well, I'm just going to keep on going then. Um, you know, uh, um, unless somebody else uh, chimes in, let's see. Oh, you're losing audio. Okay, geez, I'm sorry. Um, uh, let's see. Um, well, not sure what else I can what I can do about that. Just the last two minutes, okay. Okay. Um, let me see. Well. Um. All right. Um. Let's see. Uh, so um, let's see. I'm not sure what to uh, let's see. I'm just reading a note um, here. Doing audio. Um, okay. Well, um, I think I'm just gonna keep on moving through um, with talking about LEDs. I guess. Um, sorry if, uh, if the audio cut out for everyone or uh, or some people, um, but. Here we go. So LEDs um, have a, you know, the, the nice thing about LEDs is you can tune the spectrum um, based on um, the um, uh, the diodes you put in. So you know you can use um, white light. You can you can shift it a bit red. Um, there are some varieties that actually use uh, red or blue. Like the the um, you know you get this kind of uh, they call it blurple lighting. Um, <laughs> Um, that you can get. Um, it's not great for um, 
for observing your plants, but um, you know, some people have had great growth um, with that, um, especially bringing out colors um, in, in a lot of different species. Um, personally, I do think it's important to be able to observe your plants. Um, so, and sometimes that lighting makes it hard. Um, but anyways, just a, an efficiency summary of where we can get with LEDs. Well, um, you know, modern LEDs can get all the way up to like, uh, you know, 2.7 uh, micromoles per joule. Um, quite efficient. Um, and uh, there's, there's always improvement in the industry as well. There's, um, you know, a theoretical bound of LED efficiency of up to like 5.1, um, which, um, you know, um, it, it's always increasing year after year, right? It seems like it's moving about 0.1 to 0.2 um, uh, every year. Right. Um, so here I've got a, um, a chart of recommended PPFD levels for different carnivorous plant genera. Um, you know, I've, I've tested this um, pretty extensively in many groups, um, you know, and, and I can definitely share this range. It's also on my website, um, you know, the ultimate guide to grow lights. Um, and, you know, you can just see here that, you know, obviously there's some species that are more uh, tolerant of lower light than others, you know, say you know, a lot of the, the ones that are growing on as um, um, plants that are under the canopy, um, you know, versus other ones like uh, Sarasenia and Drosera and fly traps that are often, you know, open uh, uh, savanna type uh, growers that are getting full sun. Um, also, here's a chart for ornamentals, um, you know, that I just found also empirically. Um, you know, a lot of these, a lot of the, the popular ornamentals out there are understory plants, so um, they need less light, um, like I discussed previously. Um, here's a handy chart for converting um, Lux to PPFD. Um, so um, it, it is important to know the spectrum if you're trying to convert um, over because uh, that will uh, affect the calibration level wildly. You know, like uh, there's some basic calibration levels you can use for, um, you know, say, say you, you've got one of those economical light meters, um, you can, um, you can move over, you know, from like a sunlight uh, situation, and you know, convert to people using this number right here um, for sunlight. Um, and then, if you know the spectrum of the the, um, the LEDs you're using, you can also use this um, this calibration factor. I put one for uh, the Floorway brand. Um, you know, and also there's other types of lighting technologies like cool white fluorescent lamps that are pretty ubiquitous uh, whenever you're dealing with um, fluorescence. So that's calibration factors there as well. Um, yeah. Um, let's see, just moving on from some of the light characterization stuff. Um, um, there's, um, there's some added benefits to making sure that you're using efficient lighting. Um, one of the, the big things is thermal concerns, right? A lot of carnivorous plants, um, you know, Highland Nepenthes, Heliamphora, um, are sensitive to both uh, light and temperature. We're, we're trying to keep um, keeping it as cool as possible while providing them a high amount of light. Well, um, lighting, is, you know, inherently, um, most of those photons are lost to heat. Um, and no matter how efficient your geometry is when you're trying to illuminate the plants. And, you know, whenever you're losing um, uh, light to heat, you know, it's, it's just gonna heat up the room and it's gonna cause you to have to do things to get rid of that heat if you're gonna try to keep the environment cool. Um, so, you know, just a rule of thumb for air conditioners, for every watt of power, um, or for every um, three watts of heat you're removing, you're gonna use one watt of power. Um, so, you know, um, that this can really add, you know, the AC bills can be really prohibitive if you're using inefficient lighting. Um, you know, in some environments, it, it can be beneficial to heat just using grow lights. I know some growers that um, stick to fluorescence just because they live in cool environments and they really wanna grow, you know, like lowlanders, something like that. Um, another thing that, that uh, you can keep in mind whenever you're choosing lighting um, or lighting configurations is um, the microenvironment around the light um, can often uh, be influenced um, by, you know, just just um, very micro um, micro environmental regional factors like um, um, leaf temperature. You know, for example, in an, in, in an area where like there's not a whole lot of air movement um, going through um, will um, increase um, 
quite a bit. Like you want to make sure that you're um, distributing um, air around uh, these areas. So there's kind of a like a, a, a average temperature. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, another thing to keep in mind as well is you know just just as a rule of thumb is like for every um, um, let's see for for every inefficient um, amount of um, uh, of light or a, a amount of power that goes to your lights, um, you, you pay for it twice. Like you're both, you're paying um, both for the inefficiencies in your lighting, but you're also paying in your cooling bills, right? So it goes up by about a third, um, you know, if you're running your ACs. And then EVAP coolers, you can run the calculations as well, but you know, it's something kind of similar. Um, just another quick thing to keep in mind. I know some people experiment with this for carnivores just because they like so much light. So some people play around with daily light intervals. So as opposed to like uh, really high intensity for, you know, like 12 hours a day, they'll, they'll get, you know, you could daily light interval or you would have the equivalent daily light interval if you gave, um, you know, um, the plants like half the light, but for 24 hours. And some species are more sensitive to this than others. For example, um, dewy pines, I, I've experimented with this and you can make them prematurely bloom um, by giving them a, a, a 24 hour cycle. Like, and so they really can't be force grown and, and keep up like um, um, normal growth. Um, other genera may, may be different. I know Saracenia, um, you know, you can grow those under 24 hour lights whenever they're young and um, they seem to thrive. Um, I want to get to some of the more practical applications. So we'll just just briefly just say that like um, um, over time, um, efficient lighting like uh, LED w beats fluorescence or you know another less efficient lighting. Um, you know, and it 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 really pays uh, for itself quickly. For example, like um, if you had uh, you know a, a fluorescent light and a LED, and um, you know they were putting out a similar amount of PPF. Um, you know, over uh, the course of like um, a year, the cost would be, you know, $335 versus 257. And, you know, and over three years, it's like, you know, almost double uh, the amount of electricity you're using. Um, yeah. Sorry, that one got out of order. Um, but anyways, just going to um, uh, practical lighting considerations. So this, we can talk more about like our grow setups here, right? And, you know, maybe, um, um, some less technical aspects um, um, to keep in mind, just as you're setting things up for your plants. Um, so indoor growing geometry, this is, this is a big one. Like um, a lot of people like to grow on, uh, on shelves, like wire racks, like you see on the left. Um, so um, in these con uh, configurations, um, you just have to keep in mind that the the closer you get to the, the plants, like if you get really tight, you're not getting um, um, uh, as much uniformity whenever you actually get to the shelf. Um, you wanna be somewhere between like 18 to 24 inches. You know, if you, your shelf is about like two feet wide, like most of them are to, to get like a fairly uniform uh, distribution of light. Um, you know, assuming you're using bar lights or some type of, a, of fluorescent or, or, or something like that. Um, for, um, for grow tents, um, um, th these these are really cool because they you can have lighting um, in there and the light will tend to bounce around a lot, like around the tent, um, and um, and that will make things a bit more uniform. It won't be you know perfectly uniform, but you know it'd be better than just like say you had the lights over a shelf with uh, with no reflective background. Um, so, you know, people play around with this, um, you know, they have different luck, um, you know, uh, putting plants in different areas, you know, it's, uh, it's always fun for me to, to kind of experiment that way, like what, what grows best and like what's a little nook in like a, in a in greenhouse or a, a grow tent enclosure like this. Um, so greenhouse geometry. Um, so inherently sunlight um, into a greenhouse is pretty uniform. Like if you have all plants on a bench, um, they will um, be getting the same amount of light um, for the most part, right? Like if you have shade cloth over one plant, then yeah, that's going to be different. But for the most part, greenhouses, they, they diffuse the light a bit, um, you know, so it's kind of not, not real direct. So there's not as many shadows, um, but, you know, it stays fairly uniform um, in the greenhouse. Um, 
it gets complicated, but also, um, you know, you, you, you're able to grow more plants um, and, you know, find little um, niches um, if you start hanging things or, you know, obscuring some. So th this is Andy's orchids um, in San Diego. And this, the, Andy optimizes his space better than I think anybody I've ever seen. Um, he's got plants that are highlight growing up top uh, all the way to the bottom, which are the ones that are like canopy or uh, understory growers. And, um, you know, I, I always find it really fascinating that, that they're growing in the same environment, but he figures out little niches, you know, um, along the way where, where each species thrives. Um, so that's something to keep in mind whenever you're, you're finding locations for your plants in a, in a greenhouse. Okay, so this is uh, just a little uh, um, experiment I ran um, looking at the lighting response for Nepenthes vichii, and this is true of many Nepenthes. Um, your plants can uh, are actually really intelligent, or at least you know they've evolved very intelligently to um, um, to respond to light levels around them. So in this graphic in the upper left, you get a vichii like all these vichii were grown, um, you know, um, same same conditions prior to the experiment, same seed batch and everything, um, you know. And I found that uh, if you grow them in lower light, um, the leaves tend to be larger, um, you know, in in ratio to the pitchers. Um, if you increase the light a bit, you're gonna get larger pitchers. Um, leaves, will, leaves will stay relatively the same size as before, but if you get all the way up to like, say something like 300 um, uh, PPFD, like the one on the upper right, you're getting situations where the pitchers are very colorful and large, but at the same time, you're getting some leaf sh uh, shrinkage just because the, they don't need as much surface area to get the amount of uh, photons that, um, that are required for photosynthesis. Now I have found that plants, um, uh, especially Nepenthes, um, they, they put out those large pictures because they're making a bet. They're, they think, well, okay, there's this environment, I'm getting plenty of, of, uh, of photons, um, but what I need is nitrogen or other uh, minerals to keep on growing. So they make these large pictures thinking, okay, well, I need to trap this, uh, some, some insects. And if you feed them at this stage, um, they will um, progress pretty rapidly um, in terms of putting out larger leaves, um, you know, or, and, and also um, stronger roots. There's actually a paper um, that was published, um, I believe it was in the, let's see, I believe it was Andres Pavlok, uh, or Pavlov, um, who, who published that paper. And um, uh, he found that um, plants being fed actually um, uh, produced increased root mass. Um, but, but anyways, um, another um, thing I found about uh, you know, exposing Nepenthes to high light is if you expose them to high light and they put out large pictures, um, by the, I'd say the third leaf, the plant starts to get exhausted. It's put out a lot of its resources. So it actually will start to um, decline. So you have to be careful with this, um, you know, over the long term, um, because, you know, it can lead to the plant, you know, making the bet that, oh, I'm going to get, I need some nitrogen or other, um, other minerals. And um, if it doesn't get it, then um, it gets exhausted. Um, here's, here's a graphic of, uh, or some photos of uh, some Nepenthes that are showing signs of overexposure. Um, the, um, you know, usually what happens here, you know, just, just reading in a is uh, the leaves start to yellow. Uh, they'll put out large pictures, but, you know, once you start getting like a lot of red pigmentation in there, um, it's, um, it's, well, at least if it's spotting, um, it's a sign that the plant is undergoing stress. Um, and um, often you want to dial um, the, the light back at this point. Um, yeah, just just so that uh, the plant isn't getting so over, so overexposed because there's a lot of damaging chemical or molecular mechanisms that happen whenever plants are getting too much light. Anyways, um, you know, just to say, like we've, uh, you know, carnivoro. Um, I designed some LEDs um, which are optimized for carnivorous plants, and um, you know, um, they've got high efficiency, and they also come in form factors that are really nice for grow shelves and. Um, grow shelves, terrariums, grow tents, that sort of thing. And they're also um, uh, water resistant, um, which makes them really nice. Um, you don't have to worry about them getting splashed with water and all that. Um, yeah. So anyways, um, here's 
some references and these are all on my website you know all, all this information is in the ultimate uh guide to um to grow lights um yeah and i appreciate you guys um uh, attention all right so it's question do LDDs with far red uh, provide any benefit to carnivores? Um, that is an area of active investigation for plants in general. There's a lot of research going on. Um, there's a company called Apogee in Utah that actually um, um, has a lot of projects going right now that, that are trying to investigate that. So um, um, stay tuned. <laughs> James asked, what's the average lifespan of dual diode LED fixtures? Um, you know, um, I think it varies. Um, let's see, it can be, uh, the, the lifespan of LEDs is usually characterized by um, some charts that, um, that plot like the, like the, the number of uh, photons or PPF uh, that you can expect over time, or like number of hours. Um, th that's kind of standard publication. And usually it's, um, it lasts about, uh, well, the average like modern horticultural LED um, has a, something like a 70% uh, lifespan over equivalent of like 10 years. Um, you know, they, they, they last quite a long time, like in terms of diodes. And for the rest of the participants, if you guys have questions, feel free to enter them in the box and I will read them short. Mm -hmm. So John Endy, who did a great a uh, webinar a month or two ago on Biblis says, if using blurple lights, I suggest finding IR or UV blocking glasses. They usually look green in color and filter out the red blue to allow you to see the plants as they appear in regular light. James agrees and he says the glasses help a lot. Two out of my four LED, LED fixtures came with glasses. Mm -hmm. Rochelle says, one thing that I regularly do is keeping the grow lights clean to maximize the light they emit, removing the dust periodically. And she says she loves the discussion. It was very detailed. John Endy says, awesome presentation. And Zach says, thank you for taking the time to talk with us. Drew, are you still part of the IUCN carnivorous plant? special group? Um, yes. Yes. Um, there, there is some updates coming, um, though, um, exciting updates. So I just say stay tuned. <laughs> One concern is uh, also, I, should, I mentioned in, in the far red, um, LEDs tend to be less efficient out there. So um, even if it is beneficial to carnivores, um, you know, it, it could, it, it would require using lights that are a bit less efficient. Jason asks, are there any specific suggestions on LEDs for tuberous Drosera? Um, I would say just general white light um, and be careful with your photo periods, right? Because, you know, tuberous Drosera do, you know, they, they, they don't take well to like extended um, photo periods, you know, just because they're a winter growing plant. John Christman says, you mentioned plants becoming exhausted in higher light conditions. Have you attempted mm -hmm. to compensate for that? For example, using fertilization? Yeah, so um, that's uh, that's tricky business um, with say something like Nepenthes um, or some, some carnivores are just intolerant, right? There's there's different um, um, different uh, carnivorous groups. You know, this, this is from a paper, I forget when it was from, but um, they, they took a look at a, at a number of uh, carnivorous genera and they found that some are just completely intolerant of root fertilization, like fly traps fall into that category, where other ones um, can be supplemented. Um, and the pentheses fall into that. They can be. Um, the problems you run into there are um, you have to be careful with how. Um, how much fertilizer you're giving them, um, because that can lead to some uh, bacterial and fungal issues in the soil itself, uh, like a lot of root rot. You know, like these plants are not, uh, you know, they did not evolve in places with rich soil. Um, the other thing that you had to be concerned about is you, um, a lot of times they will not pitcher. They will not pitcher well whenever you are um, um, root fertilizing them. It's just the plant doesn't need to to go out, uh, you know, and pitcher, like put out large pitchers or colorful pitchers to, um, to sequester nutrients from insects, you know, because it's already got them. So, um, you know, it's, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a tightrope you have to walk, you know, anytime you're fertilizing carnivores, 
um, but it can be beneficial for some, right? You know, you can get increased growth. Have you found red spotting or signs of stress on a lot of the lowland Nepenthes or specifically bicales and truncata when they get up? Actually, cows, bicales put out black spots, not red. Um, whenever they're stressed. So the, the root of this, the stress response, at least for Nepenthes, is it, it's an, there's an endophytic fungus um, that, that it is um, um, present in all of Nepenthes, or at least ones that are exposed to most growth environments. Um, you know, in, in vitro that, you know, this, this isn't the case, but as soon as you plant them out, I found that like, it just happens. It's the reason why it's really difficult to meristem Nepenthes because they've always got this competing endophytic fungus endophytic fungus. Well, what happens is when Nepenthes gets stressed out, that fungus gets expressed and it gets expressed in, you know, in terms of spotting on the leaves often, right? So it could be black spotting and bad calcarata, red spotting and, and others. Um, some species are particularly prone to it, like truncata. Um, it's difficult to get uh, many truncata leaves, leaves, um, you know, in highlight conditions that are not spotted unless you're using like uh, fungicides, um, just because it, you know, it, it's, it's going to happen. Right, other species that are particularly um, uh, problematic of, of that is, for example, like so, some other ones in the uh, Truncata family, like um, like um, uh, Rob Cantlii, um, same issue. You, you often get the, that fungus expressed. If, if you're starting to, to build your own LEDs, at least um, be wary of the specs that are published for the single LED versus what's being published for um, the, um, the, the overall fixture. Um, yeah, in particular, um, the, um, you know, like e e there's inefficiencies around there, right? So, um, you know, whenever you have, you know, whatever chip expected, you know, maybe like a 2.9 um, micromos per joule or something like that. You also have to take into account like the inefficiencies introduced by the driver and your and also um, some of your heat sinking equipment around those chips, right? So some of these um, these LED chips, like uh, just based on the geometry, you can run into more heat sinking issues, and which can um, lead to heat inefficiency. Um, you know, like when, whenever things are operating at a higher temperature, you can often um, you know have have some you know like um, uh, you know, the physics just leads to energy being dissipated in, in ways that are not productive. Yeah. I'm going to go back a question or two. John uh, Christman says when he was talking about to compensate with fertilization when there's high light, he didn't no. specifically mean root fertilization. He said that in his experience has shown him that feeding Nepenthes pitchers is far more effective and as a bonus won't have any negative effect on the soil. Yeah, no, I, I find that completely true, right? It's just, uh, it depends on how you're growing, right? If you're growing in, you know, um, a smaller setup or, you know, a manageable amount where you can feed the pitchers e with, even with like an osmocote or, you know, or or like a, a dried insect, that's great. You know, that's probably the safest way to fertilize the panthes. Um, for us, we grow a lot, you know, so. Um, you don't um, hand feed all you know, of them? Yeah, we can't, we can't possibly hand feed thousands of the panthes. Right, so we we had to figure out other ways around that. Um, I will say, you know, also like I mentioned that paper during the talk, but it, it's really I, I highly recommend re reading um, um, that that paper. Um, I think they looked at Nepenthes talangensis and they were measuring root mass, and they actually they they found that um, you know um, feeding pitchers actually stimulates root growth. Yeah. What? How do you find scientific papers on carnivorous plants personally? Do you have like a Google alert or? Are yeah. You um, yeah. So, you know, it's um, I just try to pay attention to what's up there or, or what's out there. There's I think um, the ICPS is a great resource because it puts you in contact with other growers, especially the conferences. I would encourage everybody to attend as much as you can or pay attention to the webinars or all, all, and all these other things. Right. Because it puts you in contact with people or, you know, or presentations, all that things, right? Um, um, I guess, um, um, well, Kenny, you can edit this out if you want, but um, SciHub is a great resource if you're not an academic and don't have access to your li library. Um, and I, you know, you can, you can read most papers through SciHub. Very good. Zach yeah. one says he was told that certain spectrum, that 
certain spectrum of light could not penetrate through glass, for example, UVB. Is that true, Drew? Um, there are, um, let's see, UVB. Um, so I know that Zach likes, I, 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 yeah. I know he likes his reptiles and like that's why you shouldn't put like a reptile tank next to like a sunny window and think they're gonna get their full spectrum. But I don't know about how it applies to plants. Um, okay, so there is a drop off in UV. It depends on where you're at in the UV, right? Like I, there's, there is a, there, there's, there's two numbers, technical numbers. Like there's a, there's an alpha and a K um, uh, coefficients. Like whenever you're lo just looking at straight spectrum versus materials. And those depend on the type of glass you are, are, are working with for sure, right? Like, especially as you're further out, like, you know, to, to start like where you're in, um, UV ranges that are good for sterilization and things like that, um, then um, uh, those are generally much less transparent than some of the UV that's closer to the blue spectrum. Uh, I'll say that, right? And so, and then, you know, if, if there's specifically something you're looking for, you just look it up in a table and that will tell you how much it falls off. Should growers be concerned if they have a grow light on top of a glass structure, like if they have plants in a terrarium? Is the glass going to diffuse or not allow some of the light to reach the plants? Um, no, I, I would say um, generally glass is, um, you know, most of the light in the visible spectrum is, is transparent um, or, or glass is transparent to that. Um, I mean, you're going to have some loss, you know, it's going to like, you know, there's reflection coefficients, you lose 4%, like even a flat piece of glass, you, you're gonna lose 4% of the light unless there's an anti-reflection coating on it. So yeah, in that sense, you're gonna lose some, you know, if you if you have more oblique angles, you're gonna lose more. Um, but um, I wouldn't, you know, based on the benefits that you would have, like of putting like uh, something like a, a glass lid on the tank, if you, you're trying to keep up humidity or something like that, like I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't avoid it. Very good. And now we are getting a slew of Thank yous, and the presentation was wonderful, and they learned so much. Thank you so much, Drew, and we hope everyone has a good night. Bye-bye, everyone. Great, thank you. Bye. The International Carnivorous Plant Society wants you to be successful with your plants. We welcome growers just getting started all the way through professional scientists. We started an annual World Carnivorous Plant Day to celebrate these spectacular plants. Take a look around our website and you'll find historic documents about carnivorous plants, growing guides, free educational resources, and more. Have questions? Ask. We don't bite. But our plants do.